afternoon, ladies and gents. It's Simon Brown here doing this afternoon's webcast. So today we're doing portfolio diversification. And in essence, it's asset allocation is another way of putting it. And this has been a, a, a webcast that's been requested a lot. I've put it off because there's 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 a lot of hard facts, frankly, missing from 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 this area of expertise. I'm going to run through it. I'll hit. I'll get to those problems when we hit them. If you've got questions, pop them in the Q and A box. Certainly, we've got a uh, time for questions. Uh, but let's kick off. I mean, in essence, the, the what are we doing? Asset allocation is your different asset classes, and and investing across asset classes. They would be broadly uh, debt, whether it be preference shares, company debt, uh, state-owned enterprises debt, or, or government debt. It would be property, equity, uh, cash. And then commodities, and I'm going to touch on commodities now because then I kind of leave it. So there is a sense that we should have some commodity investment, and I subscribe to that. I own some platinum. So what does commodities give you in an investment portfolio? What you're looking for here is is, is different assets move at different times, respond to crises at different times and the like, and then it's a case of, well, okay – what about commodities? And, and the obvious one is, well, look at gold. Uh, you know, gold did nicely. It did, although if we go to 2009, gold did great, up 30%. The rand strengthened 30%. Your problem is rand gold. And, and, and so I've broadly said, okay, let's park commodities. I want to come back and do a webcast on, on commodities as on its own as an asset class. And why it sits on its own is because it, it pays you nothing when you hold it. And in fact, it costs you because there are storage fees associated with commodities. Of course, there's geographic and currency. We get that in the equities. We can get that in cash. We can get it in property. We can get it in debt. Uh, different sectors, which again would sit in your debt, your property, and your equity. And in the property space, it you know it, it, it's industrial versus versus retail versus office versus residential. Uh, the latter we don't really have in South Africa at all. So why do we do it? Reduces concentration risk. If you put all your eggs in one basket. And you drop that basket. If you were 100% you know, invest, invested in Brait, you've had a very good year up until yesterday. Uh, and since uh, the open of the market yesterday, if we take yesterday's 18% and today's 3%, you're down 20% in less than two days. But it's more than just not putting all your eggs into the same stock. It's not putting all your eggs into the same sector, not putting all your eggs into the same anything. You want to spread across so that you get those smooth volatility. So what you see is that different asset classes will respond to different crises differently. Some of them will be less volatile. Some of them will be more volatile. Some, like equities, really took a pounding in 2008 and 9. In truth, pretty much everything did, uh, except the RAND. If you, if you were uh, to, had a position, if you had US dollars, you did very well in that space. So it's that uncorrelated. Now, we can go and do correlation on any two asset classes. And the way correlation works, and it's it, part of Excel, you can pull the formula and run it and square it and you get the answer. Correlation runs in that if you are one, if a correlation comes out at one, you're perfectly correlated in lockstep. Uh, minus one, you're perfectly inverse correlated. So the one asset goes up a percent, you go down a percent, and zero is complete wildness. In truth, you probably want somewhere between zero. Maybe you want that minus one. I don't think you want the minus one. You want the zero. You want the uncorrelatedness between the different asset classes. The problem with checking correlation is it's time frame dependent. So if I do correlation on, let's say, Anglo and Billiton over one month, uh, one year, three years, five years, 10 years, I'm going to get different correlations depending. So I've kind of said, yes, we need uncorrelation, uncorrelated. But I'm not bothering to go and crunch the numbers because it's just it, it no longer, to my mind, is massively relevant. We average out the return. So what this does do is because it reduces risk, it reduces reward. By having uncorrelated and by removing volatility, you reduce that reward to a degree as well. So if you've got half equity and half uh, a government bonds, and let's say equity return is on average 15% a year and government bonds is on average 5% a year, you're going to get 10% a year, and your portfolio overall will give you less volatility. There are, of course, for example, Nerina Fissa will tell you from Nedbank Capital that her better beta equal weighted product uh, gives you reduced volatility with a slight outperform over the medium to long term, about a 2% over the medium to long term. Fair enough, but broadly, if you went to the extremes, uh, you know, property or sorry, debt and, 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 and equity, you're going to going to reduce volatility and you're going to reduce performance. 
So you can do it with exchange traded products. You can do it ETS and ETNs. You can do direct offshore. You can do off market. What I mean by off market is in essence off market is is is, is non uh, exchange traded products such as the retail bonds. So let's hit some nuts and bolts. Equity, high risk reward, average yield. What I mean by yield in this case is dividend yield. So you're getting about three percent or so on the average market. You can push that number higher. Certainly, you. I mean, MT and Vodacom both spring to mind. Higher risk in that they can fall a heck of a lot, but a lot more reward. And in truth, your risk reward is skewed in favor of reward because your risk is 100%. It goes bankrupt, you get nothing. Your reward can be 10 or 20 bagger. And in which case, you know, we've got Capitech, which is 150 bagger. It listed at two rand, it's trading at 300. It's gone up 150 times. When you bought it at two rand, if you bought it at two rand, your downside was 100%, two rand. Your upside is theoretically unlimited. Practically, probably not, but certainly skewed in your favor. And this, I think, is where most of us go. Most of us understand the equity space. Property, medium risk reward, higher yield. So what I mean by medium risk reward, property certainly has been shooting the lights out in the last couple of years, uh, maybe as much as the last decade. We've seen property go from trading at discount to net asset value to fair premium on net asset value. We've got stocks like Resilient trading on a yield of about 4.5%, which for a property stock is insane. You want 6, you want 8, you want 9, even 10% yield on a property stock. Medium risk because they've got an underpin of solid buildings. And that's important. Medium reward because apart from the last, and there's been a re-rating in the last decade, uh, South African property has gone from a very small, very under interesting space to a, a massively exciting and, and frankly, we're seeing bubble territory in there. But over the longer term, you're going to get medium reward and a much higher yield. Uh, dividend yields should be buying property on dividend yields of around 8 or 9%. Debt, uh, lower risk reward, higher yield. I say low or lower because, well, if you held African bank preference shares, um, sure, that wasn't. So it depends the quality of the debt. I mean, do you want ESCOM debt? Uh, no. Let's go to the European crisis in 2008. You know, Greece and Cyprus, you took some haircuts, but it was only Greece and Cyprus. There were no other defaults. Um, African bank, yeah, their pref shares are, 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 are toast. We'll see what happens to them. So it depends on the quality of that debt. You know, top of the list in terms of quality, U.S. Uh, Treasury bills, bottom of that list is some junk bond for some stock you've never heard of before. So they give you lower risk. They give you lower reward. They typically give a nice high yield, although that yield might not be any higher than property. That's actually quite fine because of your lower risk. And then cash. Cash, zero risk reward, very low yield. That's not completely true. I'm, you know, here we're talking cash under the mattress, or perhaps we're talking uh, uh, cash in the bank. Um, no, you know, it, 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 but, but perhaps we're talking US dollars. Now, that's a slightly different game because that gives you some geographic diversification, which therefore does give you some risk and reward. Um, but your, your yield there is going to be exceedingly low. At the moment, in a bank account, you're going to get between 4 and 7%, and you get heavily taxed on it. But certainly, international cash is a different game entirely because, say, for example, you've got US dollars. Rand weakens from their current 11 to, say, 12, 10, and you've made 10% on that. So you've actually got some nice reward. I suppose your risk is the RAND strengthens. The point is cash never goes bankrupt, although it can depreciate. If you're holding RANDs, your U.S. spending power depreciates. So those broadly are your four asset classes. As I said, I've left out uh, the, the commodities. But here's the problem. Everyone agrees that asset allocation is critically important. What percentages do you put into each is critically important. And in fact, I've read doing research for not only this webcast, but research over the last years to tell you that your asset allocation is perhaps the biggest single determinant of your ultimate return that your portfolio will do. In other words, it's not whether you bought Billiton or Anglo, but it's how much you put into diversified commodities and how much into equities broadly and into debt and the like. So great. So what is the model? Well, very little on the hard details. I'll be honest, when I say very little, nothing on the hard details. Nothing says to me that at this risk profile, at this age, this should be your asset allocation. Nothing. Just nothing. Uh, yeah, there's some websites where you can fill stuff out. You go to iShares.com, they'll do some stuff for you. But is it, is it you know, what is the, the math behind it and the like? Frankly, when you start digging, it, it, it's, 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 I hate to use the word, 
It's kind of a bit of guessing in a sense. So what I'd hoped for here was to say if you are a 45-year-old male with two dependents who are soon to be independent and you are married and you've got X saving, you know, blah, 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 this is your asset allocation. Can't do it. Just can't do it. So I'm going to come at this from a variety of different angles. Um, and in hindsight, yes, we can do the asset allocation. The old rule of thumb used to be the percentage in equities should be 100 less your age. Uh, Mark Wheatman at Venani has suggested that actually it should be 120 less your age because we're living so much longer. And that's a good point. You know, when we were 60, we used to be, you know, 50 years ago, 60 was close to death. Uh, now, 60 years, well, you're probably going to live, statistically, you have a 50-50 chance of living to 90. So 120 less your age, so I'm 45, so I should be putting 75% into equities and the rest into the lower, the government debts, the properties and the like. I think that's too low risk for me. I do have some property. I sold my prop tracks ETF uh, about a year or so, year and a half ago, about a year ago. Um, my sister still has a prop tracks 10 ETF. I will get back into property when the price and the valuations are better. Reason I sold it was I had the one that tracks the property index. I wanted to switch into the equal weighted prop tracks 10. So I used what I thought was crazy valuation to exit and I'll wait for an entry. Well, the timing was horrible. Hey, that happens. But I think that for me to put 75% of my investment into equities is is too low. I, I, I At the moment, I'm I'm trying to think. I mean, if we include ETFs in the space, I'm pretty much at 100%. My ETFs hold some growth points. So by proxy, I'm probably a couple of percentage points into property. Um, but otherwise, I think 75% to me seems a little low but then i'm also high risk understand i have no dependents um i have a mature portfolio that i could stop working tomorrow and and live off quality of life would probably decrease the the age of the wine i drank wouldn't be as good but i could do it so you know, and, and those are the sort of issues we need to ask ourselves so let's delve into the individuals equities local international as always winning sectors he has an important point in asset allocation so we put some money into equity and the question is Okay, we go and we pick the winning sectors. Don't go get the dogs. Go pick the winning sectors. But then I've always got the rule. So if I'm looking at financials, I can't hold more than two financials. And earlier this year, or about a year ago, I really wanted to buy Sassfin, but I already have two financials in Standard Bank and Capitec. So I needed to sell one of them. And I certainly wasn't selling uh, Capitec. And Standard Bank is, is doing well. The price is moving. It's got upside to it. Okay, look, so the 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 the... The, the SAS funds are up 60% and my standard banks are up 15 I should have bit, bit, bit the bullet. But never more than two stocks in a sector because I, what I say is if you if you can't decide which two, if you want three, well, then you can't decide. So, you know, in resources, I've got Billiton and Sassel. Um, in banks, I've got uh, Standard Bank and 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 uh, 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 Capitec. I, I have Old Mutual, but that's legacy because I have an old, a retirement annuity with them. Uh, they gave me those shares. And my view is if, if the shares are doing well, the retirement annuity probably isn't. And if the retirement annuity is doing well, probably the shares aren't. So to me, winning sectors, never more than two stocks in a sector. Now, the local international debate is becoming a little moot. We can get uh, uh, local, obviously, the JSC international. We can get JSC. SAB, uh, you know, a whole bunch of local dual listed stocks, but more than that, we can get the ETFs. And these days, investing international actually is really simple. A, a number of the of the local brokers offered via international platforms, and of course, we can go directly offshore. So then, it's to my mind is weight your portfolio to equity. What I mean by that, majority of your portfolio in equity. And I remember my view where you do the core satellite. There's a webcast on that. If you go and search starting a portfolio from scratch uh, on just one lap, where I look at having a core of ETFs. Now, ETFs are, you know, whatever you want them to be. So I'm, I'm, I'm talking agnostic to that. What I'm saying is weight your portfolio to, to equity unless you want to be incredibly low risk. You've almost certainly got more than 50% of your portfolio in shares. Be there local, be there international, be there via ETFs or direct shareholdings to my mind or unit trusts. Property. So property gives you a great yield. Absolutely no bones about that. Uh, really good re uh, dividend yield, although some of them significantly lower, but you should be buying property on a yield of around 8 or 9%. Uh, they now pay dividends, so that's really nice and chunky. What's nice with property is an asset underpin. 
They, they own buildings. Now, typically, they'll own 100 million of buildings and they'll have 80 million of debt, which is funding those buildings. And, and that's what the property companies do. Um, that's cool. That's great. Quite happy with that. But that asset underpin gives you a, a lower risk because you've got 100 million of buildings. And yes, you've got debt, um, but, but you've still got those assets. It also limits your upside to a degree because 100 million rand of buildings can only generate so much return. You know, is it is 100 million of buildings going to generate uh, 10 million a year? Sure. 20 million? Yeah, maybe. 50 million? No chance. So your upside is limited more. There's still issues around demand and the like, but your upside is a little uh, limited, but so is your downside with that asset underpin. So significantly reduces risk, but watch out for those debt levels. Now, there's some property stocks that have got debt more than their assets, and that's not a good thing. You typically want the debt to be lower than the uh, uh, asset levels, than, than, the, than the value of those properties. Of course, property valuations is subjective. Make no bones about that. How do you decide what's a fair value, what isn't a fair value? They get the experts in. The experts are probably not perfect. They revalue them about every three years. Valuing a property is not a science. That we have to accept. As I said, currently a very expensive sector. We can do individual properties in the property space. I like ETS. I like the PTX10 issued by Grinrod, and it gives you the 10 largest property stocks in South Africa, equal weight. Debt. So debt gets interesting. Government bonds is the obvious debt. Um, they pay interest. There's tax implications on interest, or debt pays interest. So government bonds, you can, buying government bonds is tricky, but there are, there's a um, RMB inflation linked, and there's a uh, ABSA Barclays, uh, or maybe it's Barclays ABSA, maybe it's just Barclays Capital, I don't know what we call them anymore, um, who've got some ETFs in the space, and of course there is the retail government bonds, which are zero cost, and actually a really good product if you're looking for good old-fashioned government bond. Yeah, it's the African government bond. But as, you know, and our, our, our government bonds are what? A couple of notches above junk. But are they going to default? No. And especially not to private individuals such as me and you. So these give you a fairly stable and a nice return. And if you buy them, if you buy an ETF, they're going to be constantly rolling. So you can hold it forever. If you buy a, a bond direct like the R153 or if you buy a retail government bond, they've got expiry periods. Um, and that's you know, relevant to interest rates. What you don't get is capital appreciation, particularly in the retail bonds, but you can get fairly decent interest rates. And then we get preference shares. These are debt instruments issued by listed and unlisted companies. Um, they pay dividends. They're typically linked to the prime rate, and they, they're quite attractive. What you're not going to get is any uh, capital appreciation. You might get a few percentage points as round, you know, from some, but you're not, that's not the plan of them. Um, and they, 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 they're a nice product, but... African bank pref share. I mean, watch out for those pref shares. If they go bust, you join the queue. So, you know, there are a bunch in the second tier space. Okay, I mean, I, in the second tier, Steinhoff, Grinrod, they're probably quite fine. Did we expect African bank to go into creatorship? Short answer, probably not. I mean, I, I certainly, as long as two years ago, said it wasn't impossible, but I certainly wasn't rushing around telling people that I thought it would happen. So nice way to get debt instruments. Nice, very low risk. I don't have any. Not a one. I, I I don't want that level of low risk at the moment, quite honestly. I, I want the risk. I want the reward. Um, and as I said, typically a good yield. Cash, uh, boring as heck, very low risk, very low yield. Um, of course, your risk and your, your can, can, can be adjusted if you go and take your cash, cash offshore. And that's easy. I mean, opening a, a – I was chatting with some, some bankers locally – Opening an offshore bank account these days is so easy. It's, it's you know, you go in, you take your FICA docs, you sign some forms, boom, it happens. Um, no fees. They, they typically want deposits of, of a minimum of 4,000, whatever the base currency is, dollars, euros, sterling, uh, someone 10 or 20,000. But, you know, it's 100% easy. And then you've got pure offshore cash, um, which gives you, which push, push, pushes your risk up in a sense. Um, but yeah, over time, 10, 20 years, is the rain going to weaken? Yeah. So it's almost guaranteed in that sense. No capital appreciation. Not true, of course. If you're buying US dollars, then you get that capital appreciation. Of course, your US dollar bank account interest rate is exactly zero. So no tax worries in that space. But otherwise, you earn the interest and you pay the tax. And you earn a modicum of interest. You've got money in a bank account in South Africa. Maybe you're earning 5 or 6% interest. You pay tax. So yield is very low but your risk is very low at the same time. 
So here's from that webcast I did earlier this year, building a core ETF portfolio. There's the link below. When we looked at the different asset classes, and, and in essence, we were doing it. So what we've got here is the three columns, a low risk, a medium, a high. Because we can't find anyone who put their head in the block, I thought, well, heck, I put my head on the block, not because I have heads to spare, but because why not? So what have we got here is, is a breakdown for model portfolio. The ones with the asterisks are the ones that I own and just different ways of how we do it. This is looking at ETFs, but we could look broadly at the percentages. So in the high risk, you've got uh, two local equities that take you to 55. And if you throw the offshore equity in, you're up to 75. Um, then your property at 15 and your debt at 10. At your low risk, your equity sitting at 30, your government debt at 30, or your debt at 35, and your property at 20. So just and your cash at 15. So just a sense of 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 some ideas of how to break it down, depending at that risk you're looking at. As I said, that risk is dependent on, you know, what is your retirement options? Do you have provident and pension and RA schemes, or is this it? Are you you know well on the road to retirement, uh, having enough, or, or are you struggling? Do you have uh, dependents? that sort of thing. Um, how, how far away are you from retirement? I mean, technically, I'm 20 years, but I, apart from four years of Standard Bank, I've never had a job. So yes, I will retire one day, but no, I won't. I'm going to be working forever in a day, perfectly honest. So you know, th that's also a, 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 what's what I'm looking for, the, the, the mootness of it. I, I don't think I'm ever really going to retire in that classic sense. So quick recap, asset allocation is important, but little hard details as to what and where and how much. And, and if you go chat to the expert, Craig Gradage springs to mind, you know, the, the, the financial advisors, um, uh, 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 the chap who's on Bruce Whitfield's show, his name escapes me. If you go and chat to them, they're going to talk to you. They're going to tell you a whole bunch around that asset allocation. But I'm not sure that there's that formula which I was looking for, that fancy, nice, easy formula. Plug it in. Boom. Here come the answers. But certainly it's a must do. Certainly we must spread across those assets. And although I'm light on, 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 on property and debt, I will pick up property in time and I will eventually in the next five or 10 years probably pick up some debt as well. Ladies and gents, if you've got any questions coming through, uh, pop them in the Q&A box. Certainly happy to take questions. I've got one uh, which is quite simply, do I currently have any uh, ETFs, uh, sorry, commodities? Yes, I own the platinum one. I'm holding it. It's looking ugly. Um, I think longer term platinum is a good asset. It is very small within my portfolio. It's probably, I bought it at probably the minimum holding, which for me is 2%. It's probably a less, it's, it's less than that because it's fallen and the rest of my portfolio has gone uh, upwards. Great question coming through around diversifieds. Yeah, and that's to my point. So, so the question from, from um, uh, Simpiwe is, is around, you know, diversifieds. You know, surely you don't want to buy Anglo, Billiton, and Glencore. Simpiwe, I agree 100%. There's absolutely no point to that. You're not going to get anything from it. You need to pick one, maybe two, but you certainly don't need uh, – uh, uh, <laughs> I'm not even – Frankly, my mind is pick the one you think is the winner. And sometimes it's hard. If I look at the four big banks and I speak to different analysts and I interview them on, on, on Stockwatch and the like, and there is equal divergence as to which one is the preferred bank. Abs is perhaps Barclays Africa Group is perhaps the lagger, but but there's you know, someone like there's a bunch who like each one of them. Um, but but we need to pick one. I, Standard Bank, my preference, because of Africa, and, and that might be diluted these days. Uh, offensive you're asking, do you think of smaller mid cap for high return? Yeah, so within my equity, and, and you can see from uh, that screen there, you can see the RMB mid cap. So I, I, I have some RMB mid cap in my sister's portfolio, and I have some smaller mid cap stocks. Technically, Capitech is a mid cap, Clover, Colgate M3 is a small. So certainly, what are the? They would fall for me within the equity space. They add a lot more risk. They add a lot more return. Um, I, I, I'm very few stocks. So I prefer the ETF or a, a, a really good unit trust, and I'm not sure there are many around. I will blatantly uh, uh, suggest that a lot of them are yeah, not not so good, perhaps. Really do your homework on, on their methodologies and the like. And, and if they're holding 50 stocks in an ETF and, and a unit trust will then go buy the RMB ETF, it's cheaper and easier. So the, And they're going to add to your risk and reward. When you're very young, you can maybe take a lot. I would still say not. I would say you want a slice of your portfolio, somewhere between 10 and 20% maybe 30% of your equity side into smaller mid-caps at the most. 
Ah, oh, Stefan, great question. How do you structure the balance between capital gains investment and income or cash flow yielding investments? So my bias is towards capital appreciation. In other words, the share price is going up. I haven't really focused towards the income, which is the dividend sort of stream at the moment. The theory being is that as you get older, you would start to focus more on the income folks and, and, and take that income. Um, and so you'll start to shift the portfolio in part actively, perhaps selling some of your gainers and, and buying into your, your prefs and the like to guarantee you some sort of return. But Warren Buffett in his letter to shareholders of 2013, so last year, last year, he dislikes dividends except for the stocks he owns. But he, that Berkshire Hathaway has never paid a dividend. And he, he ran the numbers and he said, you know what, you're better off. You're better off actually selling. You're better off, rather than focusing on high dividend yield, is actually sell some of your stocks. And now that we have a dividend withholding tax of 15% and a capital gains tax of 13.3, it's actually cheaper to sell. It's probably the same. So what I look to do, and this is something I'm going to do a webcast for, when I start getting to the point where I live off my portfolio, I'm going to do a blend of, let's say I've got 100,000, and let's say it's generating uh 4% in dividend yield per year, and it's doing me, let's say, 12% growth. So I, so it's giving me 16% a year, 4% dividend, 12% growth. I take that 4% to live on, but I need, let's say, another 4% to, 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 to really, really live on. So I then go and sell 4% of my portfolio. So my portfolio went from 100 to 116, but I sold uh, 8%, let's call that for round number, I don't know, uh, 9,000. So we're down to 107,000. 107, I'm ahead in inflation. Inflation is, let's say, 4 or 5%. So my portfolio has grown in real terms. So, so what I'm saying is, is, and as I said, I'll do a webcast, and I've given you a massively roundabout complicated answer, but it's not an easy question. Um, to me, it's a blend of, and I'm not discomfortable selling some of the shares. Uh, in a sense, it's reweighting. Capitex recent run again because I picked up more Capitex at around 206, 207 when uh, Moody's was getting more Moody and did a double downgrade on them. So my Capitex weighting's gone heavy again. So if I needed some cash flow, I could sell some Capitex. Problem, you're selling winners. <clears throat> Excuse me, selling winners. But I, I'm going to spend an entire webcast on that because I think there's a lot we can talk around that and there's a lot of ideas and theories and the like. A uh, question from Colin, is it cost effective to hedge, e.g. CFDs with a small portfolio, 100K if you diversified adequately? Uh, Colin, I'm going to assume that you mean hedge, in other words, protect yourself from downside. Uh, to my mind, the answer is no. If you have time on your side, the answer is absolutely no. Hedging is expensive for two reasons. There is a cost of transaction up front. Um, and then there is the interest burden that you have to carry. And then there's a third expense if you don't get your timing right and the market runs higher. I'm not a fan of hedging. I, I think that if you adequately, adequately diversified and age specific. So when I'm into my 60s and 70s, I will start carrying a lot more in the property and the debt space. Most definitely I will. Um, and, 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 and that will be a, 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 almost in a sense a hedge. Because although they will have tougher times when markets have tough times, they'll bounce back and my debt won't, be, won't worry about recessions. They'll still carry on paying their interest rates. And in fact, a recession probably has higher interest rates at the same time. And so in the lead into it. So Colin, I, I think no. I think if you diversified well enough, I don't think we need to worry about that. And if you have time on your side. Uh, Stefan, brilliant idea. Okay, let's do a webcast on uh, income investing. Um, I hear what you say. So, so let's do a webcast on, on how do we generate a pile of cash. So we've done high dividend yield ones before. Let's do it, but let me let me focus it less on dividend yield. Let's focus on generating cash from our cash. So I'm just making a quick note here. Okay, so so I'll do the the, the, the managing, but a, a uh, what do we call it? A uh, we call it income investing. I'm going to call it high income investing webcast. Cool. Uh, it won't be this year because I can tell you I'm winding down for this year, but I absolutely will. I'm 70, 28 years old, have no dependents, can I invest mostly 90% of my portfolio in equity? As 28 years old, no, no dependents, you don't need the money for three to five years, you can absolutely do 90% in equity. You know, when I was 28 years old, I'll be honest, and I'm excluding my primary residence, which I owned. 
um, and the car which I owned, I, I had 100% in equity. Um, and and I'm kind of fudging it there because I would have had some property via my top 40 holdings. Um, but in fact, no, when I was 28, that would have been in 98. So no, I would have been, so I would have been 100% in equity. I, I think so. At, at 28 years old, you, you're going to live to 100, man. You, you are so far away from, you, you are further away from retirement than, from dying than the retirement age. I wouldn't stress it. Absolutely not at all. Ladies and gents, I'm not seeing any more questions coming through and we have bunched our time. So that's two that I've promised you. One is, is a high income investing webcast. We'll pick up that in the new year. For money, absolute pleasure. Stefan, always a pleasure. Simpiwe, 100%. Um, so our last webcast for the year, uh, Graham, always a pleasure. Last webcast for the year coming through uh, 11 December. And then we are back. I, I take sort of five or six weeks. I'm quite aggressive on my December holidays. So I'm back uh, 19th as our first webcast of Jan. We've got a bunch of new initiatives we're kicking off in the new year. Uh, stage three of Global Dawn nomination for uh, just one.